China's outlook is getting increasingly bleak as the economy weakens, foreign investors flee, the real estate market deteriorates, and local governments run up debts. Beijing is surely worried. So, what are they doing about it? On October 24, 2023, Communist Party leader Xi Jinping made a rare visit to the central bank. On the same day, China's National People's Congress, NPC, approved a plan to issue an additional 1 trillion yuan, or about 137 billion, in treasury bonds. Will these actions revitalize the world's second largest economy? In this episode, we'll explore this topic. The national bond worth US 137 billion is issued in the name of supporting post-disaster relief and reconstruction and upgrading disaster prevention, mitigation, and relief capabilities. This is the first time in more than 20 years that the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, adjusted its budget in the middle of the year. It is a rarity for Beijing to revise the central government's financial plan outside of the usual budget cycle. China's local government debt is estimated to have grown to RMB 94 trillion. The issuance of 1 trillion treasury bonds is like a life-saving payment to them. Previously, in August 2023, China's state council sent working groups to more than 10 provinces with the most severe financial situations to check the accounts. These moves indicate that the central government's financial resources are tight as well, that it can help the locals by issuing bonds and making transfer payments instead of paying in cash. By issuing debt in the name of disaster relief and prevention, the central government is helping the localities to pay off their debts. As they don't have to pay back the debt, the central government has in fact carried the debt and bailed them out. The additional 1 trillion yuan of government bonds issued this time will be completely allocated to local governments through transfer payments and classified as the central government deficit. The repayment of the principal and interest will all be undertaken by the central government without adding repayment burden on local governments. In order to alleviate the pressure on local financing to match the repayment, the central financial subsidy standard or subsidy ratio will be appropriately increased in relevant fields in one go, so as to strengthen the support for local governments and ensure the smooth implementation of the project. However, no matter who borrows, be it the central government or the local government, it is debt regardless. Debt issuance is a way of feeding the hungry and getting through the immediate crisis for the time being. In effect, it's an inflationary policy. Push the crisis back, delay the timing of default, swap long debt for short debt, swap low interest debt for high interest debt, and push the problem back this way. There is a high probability that the fund's release would be put into some infrastructure investment, which wouldn't be able to boost domestic demand. Chinese officials at all levels have long been used to doing cosmetic work. The possibility of the financial coffers being able to achieve a surplus in the future is nowhere to be seen. If the government fails to achieve a surplus, it will have to repay more debts in the future. Meanwhile, in the special political system of the CCP, as long as money is involved, there is corruption. Thus, the direct effect of the money from the central government means another opportunity for local officials to engage in corruption and line their own pockets. For example, in the current depressed real estate industry, corruption with Chinese characteristics has arisen. There is a great deal of corruption and power manipulation within this industry. How deep is it? For example, I went to the bank to take out a mortgage, and the bank sued me for not repaying the loan on time. But after I was sued, the bank never came to enforce the judgment, and I felt quite happy. However, five or six years later, a finance company or asset company suddenly sent me a letter that the bank's claim had been transferred to them. They will continue as the applicant in the court's enforcement proceedings. When I heard this, I was a bit puzzled. Why did the bank not come to me for execution in the first place? And why did it suddenly become a personal asset management company? You don't know the deal behind it. First, as this debt is backed by property, it is a high-quality debt. However, the bank claims that it failed to execute the order for several years. It then reports to the higher level of the bank. The relevant decision-making department of the bank might say that this is a non-performing debt. For non-performing debts, they must be packaged up and sold so it is sold at a 30% discount. 
In general, the banks, to avoid suspicion, will sell to a state-owned asset management company first, but the state-owned asset management company won't notify the homeowner at this time. What's the reason for that? Why? It is a state-owned company and it has to hand over the proceeds to the state after execution. What gain will they get from doing this? That is to say, the state-owned asset management companies have become white gloves. How do they put money into their own pockets? Let's take a look. Then, after one or two years of this debt being in the hands of the state-owned asset company, they then make a report to the leadership or the board of directors, saying that this debt is acquired by us, but after one or two years of execution, or even two or three years of execution, there is still no result. What should we do? Let's package it up again and sell it. The price at this time is much lower than their acquisition price. Then who will be the third receiver of this debt? It is a company run by their own relatives or friends, a private asset management company or even a private company that isn't qualified for asset management at all. It doesn't matter, it's sold. For example, your home is mortgaged for one million. This loan with interest is now worth 3 million, and your flat is worth just 3 million. As a result, this debt is sold by the bank to the state-owned asset management company from 3 million to 1.5 million. Then the state-owned asset management company sells it to the company owned by their own relatives and friends, from a million and a half a million to probably only 500,000. And then, eventually, the private company comes as a creditor to execute the court order and take all your assets. Assets. For you, the debtor, repaying the debt is only natural, and there is nothing wrong with it. But who have you paid the money back to? You borrowed money from the bank and returned it to the private sector. It is through such a set of operations that the state's wealth has become private money. So, we think there is a lot of corruption and power manipulation in this area. We, as the executed people, have to pay back the money, but we can't let the state-owned asset go down the drain for nothing. So who is responsible for the non-execution over the past few years? My home is frozen, why don't you execute it in the first place? Then the interest afterward shouldn't be borne by me, but by you, the bank. Or, if it is a deliberate omission by the court in the middle, then you can apply for state compensation. It can be seen that the current real estate crisis hasn't shown the slightest sign of relief in China, and for some people, it's an opportunity to get rich. In September 2023, among 70 large and medium-sized cities, the prices of newly built residential flats dropped in 54 cities, and the prices of second-hand flats dropped in 65 cities. In addition, China's property giants are heavily indebted, with dozens of real estate companies having collapsed so far. And the problem of rotten-tailed buildings is lingering on, with no solutions in sight. Friends, that five-story building on the side is my flat. See? They say it's now built up to the seventh floor. It sounds good. It has already been built to the fifth floor. Yes, I'm lucky that my flat has a rough in now. As to when the fully built home will be ready, it'll depend on my luck. It's true that if you don't listen to others' advice, the consequences will stare at your face right away. When I was buying, there was still an argument that don't rush to buy now, interest rates will come down. I thought it would be fine for interest rates to drop. I would just make more money and pay off the loan early. What I didn't expect is that not only would the interest rate drop, but the building has become unfinished or rotten-tailed building. I'm not sure if I should suspend the mortgage, my friends. According to their speed of building two stories in three months, 12 months a year, four quarters, eight stories a year, the building won't be delivered until 2030. I'm really mad. In this situation, I want to recite a poem. Developers, you keep me sleepless. Developers, I can't digest the pie you drew. Developers, step by step, you trap me in. Developers, you develop real estate. How come you have turned it into a Ponzi scheme? I now have a very perplexing problem. I spend money to buy a home. 
gave all my savings to the developer and took a loan from the bank at a high interest rate. Now the bank's regulatory funds have been misappropriated. They said that my down payment was given to the developer in advance. However, the developer is no longer building the homes, and the bank still demands me to pay the monthly mortgage, even though I don't have a home anymore. Why? Isn't this a Ponzi scheme? Is there anyone in charge? Friends, don't buy a flat unless you really, really need it. The two crises that are most destructive to China's economy are the debt crisis for the local government and the real estate companies, both of which affect the banking sector. Thus, the central bank has to face up and take responsibility for solving the problems. On October 24th, Communist Party leader Xi Jinping made a rare visit to the central bank, drawing attention from all walks of life. Since the CCP took power in China, there has been no public record of the party leader visiting the central bank. In practice, there is not much to see anyway. All there is are the financial statements, so no CCP party leader ever visited the central bank in person before. Even if there were, it would be the premier or vice premier who would visit to get a briefing on the work. Xi's unprecedented visit shows that he is anxious and wants to stop the market from collapsing. He wants the central bank of China to act quickly, hoping that it would save the economy. In China's capital market, it has been all about traders and the powerful CCP elite behind them, shorting the market, harvesting leaks, and the bloodshed of retail investors over the past few decades. Leaks refer to Chinese people who are being repeatedly deceived and exploited by the government or the stock market. There will be no substantial change in this situation in the future. What the capital market needs is fundamental transparency. So regulation needs to be independent, and so does the capital market. But this is something that the CCP party leaders resolutely can't tolerate. They don't have the determination and courage to make the market really transparent. Nor do they dare to offend the powerful and rich in the CCP. Thus, there are no practical and effective actions to make the stock market favorable to the small and medium investors. Look at the way Chen Guang, the bylaw officers, sweep the streets, destroying the livelihood of the lower class people. It's just like China's economy, which still maintains the distinctive characteristics of a planned economy, where the lives of the masses are designed and planned by the CCP's rich and powerful. Here, in a central city of China, a drone captured a law enforcement officer in a white patrol car stealing red sorghum. Government workers steal people's assets blatantly. It's like the stock market clearly reaping the wealth of investors, something they don't bother to hide anymore. One can see it's the same kind of behavior, except one on a small scale and the other on a large scale. Simply by looking at China's official figures, which are retouched, huge risks can be seen. With the issuance of Treasury bonds, China's fiscal deficit rate crossed the 3% red line and rose to 3.8%. The national fiscal deficit has increased from 3.88 trillion to 4.88 trillion. The deficit ratio refers to the ratio of fiscal deficit to GDP, which is an important indicator of fiscal risk. The international safety line is 3%. The problem with China's economy doesn't lie in the issuance of new money or increasing the amount of money being injected, but in the fact that the people don't feel optimistic about the future of the economy and hesitate to spend. China's stock market has continued to fall since August 2023, with the Shanghai index breaking through 3,000 points and approaching 2,900 points on October 23rd. In September 2023, capital outflows amounted to U.S. 75 billion one month alone. Despite the Chinese media screaming for a battle of defense at 3,000 points at the A share market, many investors in the private sector have seen through China's stock market and lost confidence. Shareholders have produced this skit to poke fun at the hypocrisy of China's stock market and how bad it is. The most cost-effective index in the world is our A shares market. Yes, that's right. 
if there were a live streaming room for the A-share stock market as well. Come on, let's look at someone else's index, okay? U.S. stocks, 13,000. Nikki, 31,000. India, over 60,000. All at high levels, but we don't want any of them at such high prices. It's really not a good deal. Today, in the A-shares live stream room, the same indexes, it's 10,000 points out there, right? Yes, it's too expensive. Okay, I have 7,000 points here. Would you take it? No. What about 5,000 points? No. Today, in the A-shares live stream room, we offer 3,000 points outright. You can choose more than 5,000 stocks, and there will be more stocks added later. The same stock market that offers lower price and more quantity for you to choose from. Let me tell you, I really paid out to bring down the points. Normally, a day's fluctuation in the stock market involves a couple of thousand stocks going down, right? In today's live stream, we offer another thousand falling stocks. Is that enough? No? Not enough? Enough? We'll offer another thousand of falling stocks. This kind of price point is very hard to find in the world. Someone asked if there were any subsidies. Stamp duty has been halved. Friends, what a great benefit. The last reduction was more than 10 years ago. This time, it is directly discounted by 50%. The margin ratio for financing has been reduced from 100% to 80%. What's more, Central Huijin Investment, a national fund, has increased its holdings by 470 million. How much is the market value of A shares? 67 trillion in circulation. Don't hang up on the subsidies, okay? It's lucky you can get in now. Some people say that the subsidies are too small now. Too small? Don't talk nonsense with your eyes open, okay? It has been 3,000 points for many years. Now, even plain buns cost more, but our stock index hasn't gone up, and the listed companies have also increased to 5,000 for you. It's such a deal. Remember our slogan, the stock market does not fall and will accompany you to old age. The last sentence of the video reads, the stock market will not fall, it will accompany you to your old age. In Chinese, the word accompany is pronounced the same way as the word losing money. It's a pun meaning the stock market in China will make you lose money all the time and accompany the shareholders to their old age. At present, the CCP faces the risk of an economic crisis compounded by a financial crisis and a situation in which the stock, bond, currency, and real estate markets are all lost. Apart from the real estate market and the stock market mentioned earlier, China's official data show that in the bond market, the 10-year Treasury futures fell from 103.1 to 101.6 yuan. In the foreign exchange market, the exchange rate of renminbi against the U.S. dollar has depreciated to around 7.2 yuan, and at one time fell below 7.36 yuan. During all these crises, the central government is trying to come up with solutions, while the local governments are also working hard. Let's take a look at some of the bizarre moves that local governments have come up with. Recently, 14 government departments in Jiangsu province jointly issued a notice proposing to support 200,000 successful independent entrepreneurs every year by the end of 2025. According to the notice, professional and technical personnel of units related to government departments or institutions will retain their work positions within three years, allowing them to leave their posts to start their own businesses. During that time, they can continue to participate in social insurance and occupational pension in their original workplace, advance in salary grade as normal, etc. In addition to leaving their post to start their own businesses, professional and technical personnel of institutions can also carry out entrepreneurial activities in the form of part-time jobs, temporary jobs, and participation in project cooperation. In addition to Jiangsu province, other provinces such as Anhui, Shandong, Hernan, and Fujian have also launched similar policies, requiring government-related units of science and technology, professional and technical personnel to leave their posts to start their own business. The new term adopted is leaving the post. It's similar to the term layoff coined by the Chinese government in the 1990s when the CCP launched its model of crony capitalism, which resulted in a massive number of unemployed workers in state-owned enterprises. The government and the media created the term layoff to replace the word unemployment. Thirty years later, this trick is no longer fooling the Chinese. Netizens have commented. 
This is laying people off in disguise. Everything changes after you leave your job. After three years, no matter whether the business is successful or not, you will become the non-staff personnel. Who would go to start a business when having a position within the establishment? Do you know how much money you will lose to start your own business? Many private entrepreneurs have gone through enough miseries to know how difficult it is to start a business in China, as it lacks a normal business environment. Here's how one entrepreneur who is fairly successful describes it. What China is far ahead of is not its technology, but its way of people. Wherever there is much emphasis on connections and favors in China, wherever there is much talk about how good we are to each other, and where much drinking is involved, the economy is lagging. At the same time, where there are simple connections, the economy grows. Let me give you an example. There is a province with a large population in central China, right? Before doing business, one has to first drink two or three times before the mention of business. It's all about buddies every day with food and drink. In the end, nothing ever comes to fruition. If your investment comes to no results, the high probability is that you have failed, right? This style is not on the point at all. There are also a few northern provinces. Thirty years later, despite boasting that they know everyone, they have all sorts of connections, and what they say matters, their economy remains mediocre. Their biggest local heavy industry is barbecue, and their biggest light industry is live streaming. You can see that the economy of those places has been in a state of negative growth for the past few years, right?